I'm Jalen Sturdivant. And I'm Kinsey Adams. Welcome to a brand new season of Connected Cultures. It feels great to be back. We've got a lot of countries to talk about this season, but today we're going to tell you all about one of the most popular countries in the United States. Mexico and the U.S. share an extensive history together, and almost one-fifth of the U.S. can trace their heritage back to our southern neighbors. I sat down with my good friend and fellow App TV member, Mia Lopez, to get her perspective of Mexican culture and what she's been up to at the studio. Hey, I'm Jalen Sturdivant, and today I'm joined here by Mia Lopez. Hi, I'm Mia, and I'm a weather anchor for Buenos Dias Boon. Thank you, Jalen, for having me. Of course, thank you for joining us. There's a lot to love about Mexican culture. Can you tell us what are some of your favorite parts mm. and some of the things that mean the most to you? Yeah, um, definitely family. Most of my family uh, from Mexico is up here uh, in the East Coast. Um, and it's just getting to see them, especially on the holidays. Uh, we do have a little traditions. Christmas is Christmas Eve, Noche Buena. And we open gifts um, that day. And then just the food, our version of hot chocolate, chocolate caliente, the bread, you can never miss with the bread and the <laughs> coffee. It's just, just so typical. And, you know, I haven't been to Mexico, but my mom tells me stories of her time, all her childhood there. I know you mentioned a lot of foods and yes. special drinks <laughs> and stuff, and it's making me hungry myself. <laughs> yeah. But what's one of your favorite foods? Favorite? I have so many. Um, you can never go wrong with tortas, which mm. is like, you know, uh, like a sandwich, but it's very big. And it has like literally everything on it, avocado, tomatoes, cheese. We put cheese and tomato and sour cream on literally everything. Tacos dorados, which is like um, tacos, but not soft, hard. Um, and they're fried and they're just so good. So I'd have to say, dang, literally everything. <laughs> It's my favorite. <laughs> and I know you mentioned a lot about traditions mm -hmm. and what are some of your like favorite ways to like celebrate as far as like tradition wise? So, tradition wise, I from what I've grown up, there's so many out there, um, are like the holidays. So El Dia de los Muertos, uh, which is Day of the Dead, we have uh, by Pan Muerto, literally means uh, bread for the dead or of the dead. And it just has the little crosses on it. Um, and we eat that, the cempasuchil, I believe is a flower for that day. We also have uh, El Dia de los Reyes, which is for the king's men. And growing up, my, or my mom would tell us we'd have to leave our shoes outside the door because the king's men were gonna come and leave presents for kids who were on their best behavior. So, you know, my shoe was always out there and it was <laughs> filled, but we always got like, you know, shoes um, and like clothing, but especially toys. But you know, once you got older, you're not a little kid anymore. <laughs> but just traditions with that um, was with the holidays and just going in families. Oh, and the parties, um, like weddings, quinceañeras. Um, I went, well, traditional um, in that aspect too. The music, uh, the big mariachi that I've seen in parties is always amazing. And maybe just not mariachi, but like in bands in general, mm. their own music um, coming to play, other genres. As you mentioned previously before, you're an anchor on yes. Buenos Dias Boon. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Of course, um, Buenos Dias Boon. I think I didn't join it from the very get-go, um, but I did see my friend on it, I love her. Um, and just seeing her speak um, and just have that you know, confidence, um, you know, giving the news to the people, um, I was just like, that's, really cool, I would like to be a part of that. And so I did the arrangements and I became a part of that. And it's really helped me with being like very open and confident on obviously um, speaking in Spanish, practicing that, because um, there's always room for improvement. And just seeing that uh, with getting to know more people, the producers, the people on set, they're just so great. What's one of your favorite segments about the show? Segments, well, um, you know, the weather, no. <laughs> um, I think the news of the farandula, which is like Brenda's segment, um, obviously the top tier news that Sandra and Alex give are really important, but just, you know, a little casual spin on like, you know, averting our eyes of what's going on, which, you know, what's going on is important, we're in a pandemic, but just a little laugh there, or like, okay, what's going on in music, in TV shows, like that's always great to hear and keep up to date. What would you say the um, specific impact with Buenos Dias Boom would be? 
Um, it's definitely our audience, um, you know, people who are, you know, used to just going on about their day and they can just hear something, uh, a joke in Spanish or um, the news in Spanish. It's just, you know, it's all in Spanish and it's just something to me very beautiful that I'm just so glad to be a part of. So I think the importance of that is, you know, keeping in touch with um, our background um, in that way, our identity. And so I think with that reaching as many people possible, you know, back in my hometown um, and, you know, people on set their hometown and just anywhere that they can reach um, to that audience. And even if you don't uh, speak this language, you know, I, you know, still hear people enjoy watching it and things like that. So it's just, you know, a little different from what we're used to. So I think that's also important. Thank you again so much, Mia, for joining us today. And thank you for not only sharing your culture, but sharing details about what it's like being on Buenos Dias Boom. Yeah, so. Bye. Thank you so much, Mia. I love Buenos Dias Boom. It's one of my favorite new shows on App TV. Yeah, Buenos Dias Boom is really killing it. Thanks for everything you do for the campus and the town, Mia. When we come back, we'll hear some stories of Mexico from a professor in the government department. In 1899, the misty ridges of northwestern North Carolina became home to a simple yet powerful vision to transform lives and the region through the empowerment of education. Nearly 120 years later, students still feel the pull of this unique place, and Appalachian has remained grounded in the vision of our founders, providing rural access to a sterling education and serving the region. The Mountaineer passion for lifelong learning is cultivated from an early age. Right now, Appalachian's youngest Mountaineers are developing critical learning skills while also discovering that college is in their future. And when they are ready, their college on the mountain will be ready for them. So the children that go to school here at the Academy are from all across Forsyth County, particularly children who may be struggling readers. Um, our goal is to improve literacy for all students K-5, to work with them, um, bring in the curriculum through Appalachian State University and the reading clinic and support learning across um, all disciplines. The experience for a university student here at Middle Fork is really critical. We're able to show them what their practice that they're learning in the classroom looks like in action. So now we have this community of learners that aren't just little kindergarten through fifth grade students, but we also have teachers who are learning together with them. And they really are building a community um, that the Academy is really proud to be, to be a part of. So I've been teaching for 31 years. And one of the questions people always ask me is, why are you still doing this? Why aren't you retired? And my answer to them is because we finally got it right. Um, these children are getting to interact with university professors. They are now identifying with Appalachian. They're saying that's my college. I'm gonna go to that college on the mountain. Uh, and they're very excited about that. And so now, you know, these are children who could be first generation college students. Um, and they're already thinking about it and identifying as college students. I love being here. I love being at the Academy because this is like uh, one of the best opportunities that a principal can have. I mean, the amount of support I've had as a principal, I, I, it's just overwhelming. And I just like being a voice for children and to be a partner with the parents and a partner, you know, on behalf of App State University, this is what I love doing, so I'm very thankful. Hey everyone, I am Conroe Daugherty from Connected Cultures, and today I am here with Dr. Cisneros of the Department of Government and Justice. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for, for, for coming to see me. So I read your biography on App State's website. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've been studying over your life and what you practice here at App State? Yes, uh, so I basically uh, started reading from a very young age. My dad had a massive library. Um, he's, uh, he's also a scholar. Uh, so shout out to the original Dr. Cisneros. Um, so being an only child and staying inside, there wasn't much to do. So I just became passionate about reading. By exploring the world through the pages of the great classics and different authors, 
I just became very driven about the idea of seeing these great things for myself. So I started traveling when I was 16. Um, I spent my first summer here in the United States. I, I spent that summer when one of my dad's colleagues at the uh, Texas Christian University and I did my, did my minor in political communication at TCU. Okay. Um, I went back to forward. I was heavily involved in uh, student government. I was also a founding brother for Lambda Theta Phi, mm -hmm. the most prestigious wow. Latin fraternity in the United States. I was the first ever non-American Latino um, person to ever serve in student government and, and I became the multicultural chairperson. Uh, from that on, um, I was able to graduate uh, top of my class. I graduated magna cum laude. Actually, my little award is sitting up there okay. as part of the Eagle Wall. I attended the University of East Anglia, which is one of the best universities for development in the UK. Okay. And I learned massively inside, but also outside of the classroom. By really reaching out and trying to meet people from every nationality and uh, different beliefs and different ways of seeing the world, I got this tremendous hunger for learning more, for trying to push myself into becoming a world ambassador and to represent my culture, my family and myself in the better light to build connections with other people. One of my good friends um, invited me to teach a class in English on American government. Uh, I said, look, you know, I have a regular nine to five. The only way I can do it is, you know, if, uh, if you schedule it for late night. I said, like, whatever you want. I even double what you pay. And I'm like, wow, that sounds good to me. As a family dude, you're always chasing money. Right. So I ended up doing it. But the minute I started prepping, man, the minute I started reading and, and, and just like making your PowerPoint presentations and just like reading back on, on United States history and, and philosophy and political uh, philosophy, I was really drawn to the whole process of academia. Not only preparing, but delivering and connecting. One of uh, our former colleagues was not able to come in an exchange program to the University of Puebla that last minute I was able to come here as a visiting professor in 2016. And the minute I arrived, profoundly impacted by the beauty of this place in the world. I remember the last night I was here in 2016, one of my friends uh, allowed me to drive his truck. Mm -hmm. I went out on the parkway yeah. and I sat down <laughs> and I watched the sunset oh. and I promised myself I would be back. And here I am. If it were up to me, I would live here all of my life. Uh, I love teaching. Um, I love connecting and I love the energy that, I, that I, I, I draw from young people. That keeps me alive, that keeps me going. And it keeps me hungry and it keeps me driven. I definitely think he's found his calling here in the mountains. I love his passion for connecting with people from different backgrounds and perspectives, just like we do here at Connect the Cultures. Right. Don't go too far. When we come back, Dr. Cisneros will tell us what makes him proud about Mexico.
Do you like video game news and entertainment? Well, App TV's original gaming news channel, Pixel Peak, is back for our eighth season. Every other week, we discuss news stories, give a game review, display gameplay, and more. Be sure to check out our new season bi weekly on Thursdays at 3 on WatchAppTV.com, SkyBest Channel 20 and 1020, Spectrum Channel 198, or on App State's Campus Television Channel 23.3. Thanks for stopping by, and we hope to see you next time on Pixel Peak. Ah, uh, memories. A sweet retrospective look at the past. However, the past has, well, passed. And now, a new and better crew looks toward the horizon and marches toward Appalachian State head-on. This spring, look toward App Avenue on App TV to see a new legacy be written on random days of the week. No, seriously, this show will literally be airing any day of the week, so stay glued to those screens. We'll see you out there. Appalachian Avenue! It's time for Sports Wrap on 90.5 WASU-FM. Unpredictable. NC State can be on a That is true. I feel like they do have one of these games yeah. uh, in this part of the season every year. I'm not going to get into a big discussion about expanding it. I definitely think it should be maybe capped at eight teams, maybe I six. Because six, 228 yards on the ground as compared to a total of 55 for Coastal Carolina. I count one team on the, on, of the six games that they have played this year that was in the playoffs last year. Hi, neighbor. I'm Ryan Perone. And I'm Elena Jones. Join us every Tuesday at 10 a.m. as we explore the events, organizations, and people that make the high country so special. You can tune in on Channel 198 for Spectrum customers, Channel 20 or 1020 for SkyBest customers, or Channel 23-3 on campus. Also, make sure to follow us at Instagram at hi underscore neighbor app TV for up-to-date coverage of events happening and student-made content. Until then, bye, bye neighbor. neighbor. Welcome back to Connected Cultures. We left off in the middle of Dr. Cisneros' interview. Let's finish what he had to say about Mexico. So, Dr. Cisneros, what parts of Mexico do you miss the most? Oh man, the food, dude. The food. <laughs> I mean, there, I there is a, the only place I could vouch for uh, here in Boone is the red taco truck. Yes. You need to try it. Really? There is, a, there is a dish called Menudo. They serve on Wednesdays. It will just blow your mind. Okay. Having said that, there are so many other things. Uh, the celebration of the Day of the Dead, um, which is my favorite. Yeah. People will only die when you forget about them. It is the very essence of our celebration. So we will cook a feast uh, and we will prepare all of the dishes that our faithful departed loved. And we just put it up uh, in an altar uh, with their pictures and everything, and we just leave it overnight, and the next morning, we will eat those, uh, that, that food. But um, it is our belief that on the second night of November, the spirits of our faithful departed come and see that we haven't forgot about them, and that we cook our food. And they take the spirit, and they have this spiritual food. It is a very, um, incredible way of uh, staying grounded, staying connected. We, it's a celebration of life, uh, as paradoxical as that sounds, but the Day of the Dead is a celebration of life. You see, you go to the, to the cemeteries and everything is like decorated and we have fireworks and we have flowers from every single color possible in the imagination and everybody decorates their houses and uh, and in your opinion, what would you say makes Mexico unique in the world? Well, I mean, we have a very rich uh, history of being very resilient. Is the attitude that we have towards life. Um, being a developing country, being full of poverty and many other societal and governmental problems, you tend to live hard lives. Mexican workers work the most hours in the world. We are hustlers, dude. We are out every day chasing that money. But while we do it, we're not like poopy pounce about it. We're not sad about it. We have a real positive attitude in the face of adversity. A every single uh, small town, for example, or to the best of my knowledge in Mexico, 
has this tradition called tekyo. Say your house was uh, washed down by the river and the whole community will come together and like you and your wife can stay in our house, you're gonna share our food and on the weekends, on every, and, and every single opportunity, we're gonna come out and, we, and we're gonna help you rebuild your house. You will not have to pay anybody either for their hospitality or their help because that's what a community does. If another member of a community, you better get your butt in gear and go on and help because that community already helped you. And that is something that um, I really see translates here. Last Friday, um, as I said, we live in Deep Gap. I was uh, driving 0421, a deer just jumped in front of my truck. Nothing could be done, nothing whatsoever. So basically half of the, of the truck is gone. The deer is ready for tacos. I put, I put an ad on Appalachian Classifieds. In less than two days, people had sorted me out, told me where to take my truck to the best mechanic, uh, and a few people just uh, volunteered to either give me rides or rent me their car or loan me their car. I am super proud to be part of such an amazing community. The fact that people will just reach out. I know it yeah. sucks, uh, I know it's hard, but you know, I'm gonna try to help you out. Mm -hmm. Just the same as take you in Mexico. So I see this parallel and uh, it's, you know, it just confirms that this is just the best place in Earth, man. That is why I love this place. Well, of course, I'm glad you're okay from the deer accident, but thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me and this has been wonderful. Thank you very much, Connor. Thank you very much, all. And uh, yeah, um, come by to see me any anytime you want. I am in 353D at Ambelk. I love coffee and I enjoy talking to people. Thank you very much. You know, we do have Techio here at App State. Mountaineers are always here to lend a hand. That's true. Community is everything. Now we're going to take a look at my package about Mexico and all these interesting facts I found. Hi everyone, it's Kinsey from Connected Cultures, and I was wondering what you think about when you hear the word Mexico. Is it chocolate? Is it a tropical vacation? Although it was ranked the top 10 most visited place in the world, there's so much more. Mexican Independence Day is celebrated on September 16th, which is the first day of the war in 1821, where they gained their independence from Spain. Mexico is one of the most linguistically diverse countries in the world. There are over 69 different languages, the top being Spanish, but the rest are all indigenous to Mexico. And there's no official language in Mexico, much like the United States of America. The largest pyramid in the world is located in Mexico. Yeah, that's right, not Egypt, it's not the pyramids of Giza, but it's called Cholula. It's interesting to know that the meteorite over 65 million years ago that killed all of the dinosaurs and made them go extinct was located in Mexico, off of a peninsula called Yucatan. Mexico is the top consumer of Coca-Cola. 163 liters is drank per person per year in Mexico. Since Mexico City was built on top of old lakes, it causes it to sink 12 centimeters annually. Because of this, most buildings resemble the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Mexico holds 10 to 12 percent of the world's biodiversity. Because of this, Mexico is the fourth most biodiverse country in the world. Mexico is known for its beautiful cenotes, which is a water pit resembling a water-filled cave that a lot of tourists love to swim in, but it used to be used as a water source for the Mayans. I was so surprised to learn the things that I did about Mexico. Now I'm definitely craving the food, and I'm hopping on the next flight, and who's coming with me? We've had some great interviews from Mia Lopez and Dr. Cisneros, but now I think it's time to get cooking. Seth's gonna show us how to make some authentic quesadillas. Hey guys, I'm Seth, and I'm back for half the mid-season premiere of Connected Cultures. Hi, and welcome back to Connected Cultures. It's been far too long. I'm Seth Peterson, and today we're gonna be cooking quesadillas, but with a twist. It's going to have chipotle relish and some mango salsa. Ooh, I'm so excited for this. Super hungry, haven't eaten all day, and I'm just, I'm about ready to get into it. All right, let's get cooking. For this recipe, you'll need the following. One and a half tablespoons of olive oil, one large onion, eight garlic cloves, 
two tablespoons of chopped chipotle chilies and adobo, 400 grams of canned chopped tomatoes, a fourth cup of tomato paste, one cup of malt vinegar, 120 grams of sugar, mango cubes, one avocado, one long red chili pepper, juiced limes, a cup of finely chopped coriander, tortillas, barbecue chicken shredded, and finally two and a half cups of grated mozzarella. I start off by finely chopping the onions, which will then go into the heated pan. And maybe have some gum on the side, just in case your eyes begin to water like mine did. Add oil to your pan and set the heat to medium. You can either chop or grate your garlic cloves and add them to your heated pan, as well as your onions, and stir. Add your chipotle chilies in adobo. Add your malt vinegar tomato paste, and canned chopped tomatoes, though I recommend not getting the can with the puree like I did. Add your sugar, water, and salt. Reduce the heat to a low and stir occasionally for 45 minutes, unless you have the lack of patience like I do and set the heat to a medium while stirring. For your salsa, chop your avocado into cubes, add mango cubes, coriander, Juice your limes, and finally add the chili, and mash. While occasionally checking in on your relish in a new oiled pan, add your shredded barbecue chicken, and heat it up. At this time, you'll combine each section of the recipe on one half of the tortilla. And don't be me and forget to cook each side of the tortilla for two minutes before serving. Add your lime wedges on the side for extra effect. Right here, I'm giving it the old smell test before consuming. And optionally, you can top it off with more hot sauce. Oh, everything's looking so good and tasty. Can't wait to bite into this thing, except for missing one key ingredient. I forgot the mozzarella. my mic went out in this portion of the video, but I do remember giving the quesadilla a positive review and pointing out just how good that mango salsa was. Now for a brief history of the quesadilla itself. Tortillas have been around since the Aztec era, but it was the southern regions of Mexico where we saw the first use of the queso and stringy cheese filled quesadillas. Ever since it's been a staple in households everywhere. While I did not create the perfect quesadilla, I enjoyed it nonetheless, and I hope you enjoyed watching me. Thank you for tuning in to Connected Cultures once again, and I'll see you next time. Thanks, Seth. Those quesadillas look very delicious. And I might have to hit up that taco truck Dr. Cisnero was talking about. Thanks for watching Connected Cultures as we explore Mexico and its culture. Tune in Friday, February 25th at 10 a.m. when we'll be talking about South Africa. Bye. Bye. Oh, the shoes. Look, we're all <laughs> the kind kicks. of matching, too. Yeah, dude. <laughs> it's, it's funny because uh, I'm obviously a massive uh, Michael Jordan fan. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, real Jordans cost like 2,000 bucks. And I found this in Mexico for 50 bucks. No way. And I was so stoked about it. Welcome back to Connected Cultures. I'm in the attic. Ma pa ta. Ma pot. <laughs> Carlos Ma would be so proud. Hi, I'm Jalen Sertiman, and today I'm here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Techio, 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 Techio. I definitely think he's. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh. Sorry, sorry. Techio. <laughs> 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 <laughs>